Life, am I right? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tark Talks, the show where I take all the news that I found interesting from last month, I give you a few thoughts on the matter, and I share some stuff that I thought was pretty cool. Basically, this is a budget Philip DeFranco, and now also, I guess, a budget how-to basic. A lot happened this month, a lot of it's pretty minor, but uh, some of it is definitely not something to be forgotten or even really just dismissed jokingly. But let's start off with something lighthearted and uh, meme-oriented. <laughs> Yes, oof, the classic Roblox noise that is not at all a Roblox noise. It's been known for quite a while that this sound effect was a stolen asset from a 2000 video game called Messiah. The sound effect was credited to an engineer named Joey Kuras, who worked with its copyright holder, Tommy Tallarico, in its creation. Tommy Tallarico, many of you may remember from the old days of G4 Tech TV and shows like Electric Playground or Reviews on the Run. Others may know him for his work composing music for video games or hosting the video games live concert. And more of you still may know him from his recent venture, the Intellivision Amico, a new home console slated to bring things back to the basics and be a hub for family fun entertainment. Tommy has known of Roblox using the sound effect for quite some time and offered them a chance to license the sound and continue its use. In response, Roblox basically told him where to go shove it and he proceeded to threaten legal action. Roblox with no leg to stand on caved pretty much immediately and the oof sound effect is is to be no more. In my opinion, Tommy is well within his right. Whether or not the sound was making money for him outside of Roblox is pretty irrelevant. Such a factor shouldn't decide whether or not it's okay to take something for free. The sound effect is his intellectual property and the result of his and somebody else's work. People's work should not be granted for free. Many Roblox fans were upset at him, but well, maybe next year they'll turn 13 and understand a little better. Despite all this though, even when the sound is long gone, we'll all know it as the Roblox death noise and its legacy will live on. Now this probably wouldn't be a Tark Talks if we didn't have at least some Kaseki news and yeah. We got some, like always. First off, we got some updates on the Zero and Aono Kiseki Kai PS4 ports. Each game has got a Japanese release date slated for this spring, April 23rd and May 28th, 2020 respectively. But this is hardly the exciting part. Falcom has shared some new screens with us, which highlight some of the game's expanded content. And in these, we have a young Yuna Crawford, whose first appearance otherwise was in Trails of Cold Steel Part 3. Though a completely unnecessary addition, this will actually add a lot for new players playing through the games in order. It will allow them to get an even more organic feel of the world and evolution as the series progresses. From here, I think we can expect to see even more changes and even more characters from the Cold Steel arc, not the least of whom being Toa, who, as we learned from Cold Steel, was actually in Crossbell for some of their more harrowing moments. But if you played Zero Now No Kaseki, she was nowhere to be found. While not exactly a major inconsistency, it is nice to see that it's being addressed. Falcom also shared some screens from Hajimari no Kiseki, and my god, this game is looking so clean. It looks like the entire Crossbell crew is back, and Rixia is looking fine. Honestly, giving Sarah a run for my MILF money. During an otherwise kind of boring panel that NIS America held at PAX, we got the official announcement of Cold Steel 3 coming to PC. They also announced changes coming to the PC version of Ease 8. Most of these changes are visual and stability related, but there's also a new experimental multiplayer mode. Some intriguing statements were made by Durante, the man who'd been updating Ease 8 and porting Cold Steel 3 to PC, in a Reddit AMA after the PAX panel was over. When asked how many other large-scale projects he had in the works, he gave a coy and riddled response of more than zero, less than four, which to those who want to believe means they're localizing three games, Zero and Aono Kiseki Kai and Cold Steel 4. Sadly, not all of the Kaseki news this month is good news, and this puts me into a very compromising position. The Legend of Heroes series is an Achilles heel for me. I can't and I will not bring myself to not buy one of these and not play it. I am in too deep at this point, which is why it really stung this past month to hear this from the localization team. Like, we tried to kind of work around um, things that might be a little sexist, for example, like in Japanese humor. Um, activate fire. And with those things, we like to try to make now. it more culturally appropriate. 
That's right. NIS America has admitted to censoring in-game dialogue that they deemed sexist. Virtuous though they believe themselves to be, I can't just accept this. If there is something sexist in the game, it's highly likely it's part of the dialogue or written text of the game, and I think it should be intact. If a character has sexist thoughts, I want to hear them. Not because I think sexism is good, but because their sexism is part of their character and part of their group dynamics. When removed, we don't get their full character anymore. What NIS America is doing is beyond the realm of localization in my eyes. This is babysitting and belittling, but as I said, I can't just pull out now and I won't. This is one of my all-time favorite franchises. The most I'm going to do here is inform people about what has come to light and express my regret and disdain for these decisions. I don't know what lapse in judgment led to these streamers thinking that saying something like this to their audience at a time where issues like this are extremely volatile was a good idea. But please, I beg you to take more caution. Be more cautious of the effect of changing a game's material based on your moral standards, and be even more cautious when breaking the news of what you've done. These things shouldn't be said lightly, and they don't just pass lightly either. Now before we head into the middle part of this show, let's get the uh, delay report out of the way. Cyberpunk 2077 and Final Fantasy VII Remastered are both delayed. Cyberpunk is being delayed until September 17th, and the Final Fantasy VII Remake Part 1 is being delayed until April 10th. Just 10 days too early to make any good jokes on. At the very least though, we do have a new trailer for Final Fantasy VII Remake, and it does feature Tifa in a very special dress that makes her like like a cold glass of water on a hot day. We also have reports of a leaked demo for the game, which, from those who played it, seems to show a lot of promise. It's also been data mined, and much of the stuff found in its code points to very late portions of the game already having their development started and well underway. So if Final Fantasy VII Remake doesn't launch as a full game, which I don't believe it will, it seems like the rest of it won't be far behind. In lighter news, we have Fate Grand Order being recognized as Twitter's most talked about game of 2019. While this may seem like a shock, I feel this mostly just has to do with the amount of time certain hashtags, like hashtag FGO, have been used. If you've ever perused this tag, or if you follow many lewd artists on Twitter, you'll quickly understand why this was in such heavy use. The fan service fan art for this game is waifu heaven as far as the eye can see. We also had an announcement that opened the online salt mines this past month, which came from none other than Nintendo, when Byleth was named as the final fighter for the Smash Bros. Season Pass. Though people were upset their choices didn't make it in and we got yet another Fire Emblem character, it largely seemed after the character dropped that people really found Byleth a fun character, so thankfully a lot of the rage blew over quickly. Though this is also the Smash Bros. fanbase we're talking about, the salt mines kind of run year long on these guys. And don't any of you guys get mad at me for saying that because Smash fans or not, you guys know it's true. We also had an announcement of Horizon Zero Dawn heading to PC. I actually didn't see this one coming, but it sparked some great debate. Personally, I think this is a good thing despite the foundation for all of my beliefs. I've always believed that exclusives were good. Exclusives fuel competition between companies. Competition causes companies to underprice or overoffer their industry brothers and sisters. This helps prevent monopolies, which ultimately boils down to lower prices for consumers and companies trying harder to offer the best services. At least, that's how it's supposed to work. Not everybody follows this game plan. That said, exclusives do have a window of relevancy. We are nearing the end of the PlayStation 4's lifespan. Being an exclusive won't be helping the PlayStation 4 much longer, and it certainly won't be helping the companies who made the game anymore either. On top of this, those who were willing to buy a console to play these games early have already done so, and the market on PS4 is largely tapped out. So it seems, at least to me, like a decent compromise between games gamers on separate platforms and the necessity of exclusives to make the move when home turf is no longer a great boon to either party involved. Now for games to look forward to this month, well, I put out some feelers on Twitter to see what you guys were looking forward to, but for the most part, you're all saying the same thing with a couple exceptions. Most of you are still catching up on your backlog, 
or holding out for a really crowded March and April. But what we do have is enough to fill a month anyway if you're interested. The Yakuza 3 through 5 Remaster gets its official physical release on February 11th on the PlayStation 4. That's three high quality games at a budget price and hundreds of hours of gameplay. Probably the most bang for your buck you'll see all month and for the next few months to come. Azure Lane Crosswave releases on February 13th and Rune Factory 4 special on February 25th, which, as a port of a 3DS game, is actually releasing at a budget cost, and I might look into it. I've always had a passing interest in this series, but never actually took the plunge. For channels this month, I want to share two music channels. First, Vakarash, who many of you Kaseki fans, and possibly you JoJo fans as well, might already know. This guy puts out covers of video game and anime OSTs like a madman. Honestly not sure how he takes the time to learn them, but it's always fun to hear these tunes reimagined as solo accordion pieces. I'm also throwing in Toxic Eternity here, who does some really high quality metal covers of video game OSTs. Now channels like his might seem like a dime a dozen, but this dude's intuition, his sound, and his attention to detail really set him a bar above the rest. Links to those channels will be in the description below. Now I know this is a bit of a long one, or at least it feels like a long one to me, but there's two more stories I want to get to here. First off, let's look at the latest Funimation fiasco. Recently, Funimation was providing a simuldub for the show Interspecies Reviewer based on the rather etchy manga of the same name. By the time the third episode aired, it was becoming rather apparent that this wasn't just the run-of-the-mill level of etchy. By the time the simuldub for episode 4 was complete and the folks at Funimation in charge of listing it on their website got a hold of it, the show was pulled and deemed not up to the standards of their website. Now, with shows like Valkyrie Drive Mermaid already running on their service uncensored, it's hard to imagine that Interspecies species reviewer went beyond what they were comfortable with, but all speculation seems to point in that direction. What happens next with the show is up in the air, and has me a little bit concerned. I fully suspect Funimation will completely drop the show and leave it dropped. The dub will not be complete, and the license will be stuck in limbo until it expires. What I would like to see, however, even if Funimation isn't comfortable with putting this on their streaming service, I think they should finish the dub. I think they should prep for a Blu-ray release and at least sell the product. I think that thanks to the controversy and the new barrier of entry to viewing the show, a certain mystique would begin to surround it. And even if sales aren't comparable to some of their other releases, at the end of the day, they'll likely still be able to claim the record of having the world's best selling erotic anime. Just for that record alone, I think they should put it out. But I also think they should finish what they start. It's just the honorable thing to do. I wouldn't let the license go to waste. I wouldn't let the actors and translators' hard work go to waste. And I wouldn't leave the blossoming fan base completely in the dark. Hell, if you have to sub-license it out just to make it look like your name's not actually attached, by all means, go for it. But see the job through to the end. You did, after all, sign on for it. And in the final piece of news today, I'd like to take a moment to remember a certain anime director by the name of Yuji Yamaguchi. On January 9th, Studio Dean took to Twitter to confirm the death of famed director Yuji Yamaguchi, though they did not state a date nor cause of death. This announcement caused an outpouring of sentiments from fans as they banded together to remember the man, as well as his biggest contributions to his art and medium. One of his biggest contributions being one of the arguably most cherished anime to have ever come to exist. Yuji, of course, was most famous for his anime adaptation of Fate Stay Night, an anime that brought new fans and old fans alike into the series. Even though the show had deviated from the source material in certain areas and left some things with less insight than some fans of the original visual novel would have preferred, what he created was still ultimately cherished by many. Looking at Yuji's body of work shows a man with ambition more than anything. Clearly, not every show he's ever worked on was the biggest success, and not much could ever hope to reach the praise he received for Fate Stay Night. But there's no doubt that the man was one of creativity, ingenuity, and passion. So in honor of the man, maybe throw in a show of his you like or just want to see again. And if you've never seen Fate Stay Night before, consider giving it a chance. The world of anime and the Fate series especially owe a lot to Yuji Yamaguchi 
and his guidance as a director for the series. And that's where I'm gonna leave the Tark Talks this month, ladies and gentlemen. If you guys like the video, you know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, and share the video if you can. Links to all my socials and the Plugs channels are in the description below. And as always, folks, thanks for watching.